Um, hello, my name is Melissa of Dalmeda, and I am uh, broadcasting to you live from the Barony of Glamere in the Kingdom of Ontir, uh, which is Olympia, Washington, for those of you who are not part of the SCA world. And um, I am a modern beekeeper. So when I started beekeeping, I joined the SCA shortly thereafter and um, had to learn all things beekeeping for my persona. Um, and I'm an ancient Greek persona, which is why my name is Melissa, because Melissa is the Greek word for honeybee. And so I promptly had to go learn everything I possibly could about ancient beekeeping. And um, then as time went on, I decided that there were some other pretty cool things about beekeeping that happens additionally in the Middle Ages. So this is beekeeping through the ages. Um, next slide. Uh, so about bees. So honeybees, there are seven different species of honeybees throughout the world um, and about 44 different subspecies. So when we talk about the honeybee, um, we're talking, I am talking mostly about um, uh, scientific term Apis mellifera. Um, and then uh, we go down into deeper subsections. So if you're a beekeeper, oftentimes you have um, Italian honeybees or Carnolian honeybees or Russian honeybees or Africanized honeybees and they're all Apis mellifera. They're all just different subspecies of honeybees. Um, so when I'm talking about honeybees, I'm talking about Apis, Apis mellifera um, versus the ones that are like in Australia that are native to Australia that make comb in spirals or the ones that are from South America which are stingless. Um, I'm talking about the common European honeybee. Uh, next slide. So um, origin of the species. The honeybee um, probably originated in um, trop eastern tropical Africa and then spread to Europe and eastwards into Asia. Um, early in antiquity, the honeybee was found in caves and has since evolved into a separate species as a subspecies that have different environmental preferences, temperance, temperaments, um, behaviors, um, like the Carnolian honeybee makes more propolis, but the Italian honeybee is more gentle. Um, there are uh, Mesolithic paintings in eastern Spain that depict honey hunting dating between 8,000 and 2,000 BC and large quantities of honey have been found in Egyptian tombs. Um, and then, of course, there are also cave or um, hieroglyphic depictions of um, beekeeping on the walls of those Egyptian tombs. Um, click. And, ooh, too far. One back. Sorry. Um, so the honey hunting is, uh, I'm watching two different screens here, it's weird. Um, so honey hunting was probably your original form of, of beekeeping. Um, so we had tracking wild bees to their hives and then harvesting the honey found there. So that cave painting is, is honey hunting. Um, over time, you know, we had, they had to figure out how to track down and make it easier for man because we're a lazy creature um, in all aspects. Uh, so we would figure out how to do semi-wild bees where we would, the beekeeper would encourage them to swarm or move to areas near his home or they'll have figured out uh, specific regions that they could go to um, or they would transport the honey from wherever they had nested to their apiary. Um, so there are some Aboriginal societies in Africa and Asia that still practice um, what we know of as honey hunting. And then um, modern bees are kept mostly in apiaries. And one of the interesting things about honeybees is that um, they can be found on every continent in the world except for Antarctica. And when honeybees came to the Americas, settlers brought them in 1622, but the west coast, the California of, of the United States did not receive honeybees well until the 1850s. Um, so uh, the First Nations people of Americas called them the white man's flies because they would travel ahead of the white man, um, which was kind of one of those interesting things. Uh, next slide, please. So bees in a colony. 
Um, so with bees within a colony, we have three bees inside of a colony. Um, we have the queen, which is always female. Every colony only has one queen. And when the bees outgrow their hive, have an aging queen, or lose their queen, they'll produce another queen bee to either swarm and take some of the population with her or to replace the aging or missing queen. Um, the queen does have a stinger and she'll use it to kill any rivals that are in the larval stage when she is in the process of, of becoming the queen. Um, the worker bee is always female. The worker bee is, has a life cycle that's typically five to six weeks long during the summertime. Um, and she'll start, you know, she does the, the egg larva pupa um, adult bee, and then she'll start as a nurse bee, and then become a guard bee, and then she'll be a bee that goes out and collects pollen and nectar. And they are capable of laying eggs, but because they're all unfertilized, they become drones. Um, and the drone is the, um, they're always male. Um, they are, um, uh, they live within the hive in the quality. They provide nothing. And um, one of those ancient Greek and Roman philosophers say, both gods and men are angry with a man who lives idle. For in nature, he is like the stingless drone who wastes the labor of the bees eating without working. Um, and uh, really the only reason to have drones is so that they can go fly in the drone congregation area and impregnate queen bees. That's their only purpose. Um, that's what they're good for. Uh, next slide. Um, so hives. Um, so for the purpose of a hive, for the purpose of this discussion, the hive is the cavity in which all bees live. Um, so my lovely image here is a, a, a colony of bees that does not have a hive because it's just comb. Um, the honeybees only build comb out of wax that they produce and so like the beehives that look like wasps nests are not honeybees, and that's Winnie the Pooh's fault. Winnie the Pooh, I blame him. Um, so, but in order for the common honeybee, the European honeybee, to survive outside of a hive, typically they need their outside temperatures to be at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit and not raining for at least as long as it takes them to build the comb structure that they can insulate and heat themselves because they are capable of like creating uh, a mass and heating that area. So during the winter times when you have below freezing temperatures, they are maintaining the internal temperature of their hive at approximately 60 degrees. Oh. So uh, comb is what the bees create within the hive. It's made out of wax, which the bees secrete from their body. And they build it into a hexagonal comb structure. Um, it's where they store their food and their offspring. And it's always plumb, which is like level to gravity, right? Um, so, and they build it in whichever shape that they need to build it in within their cavity space, unless they don't have, um, and they'll always leave bee spaces for themselves, um, which wasn't actually discovered until 19 or 1851 by Langstroth. We'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. Um, so we have ancient hives, which, um, in the early Mediterranean societies were made of, um, we have hives that were made of a variety of materials and styles, um, which could have been clay, wicker, bark, wood, stone, straw, um, though all of the official people in the area said that they want, the, the Romans specifically, want it to be made of like straw and um, bark because the, clay or brick or stone became too hot or too cold, according to the Romans. Um, there is a mention of translucent hives that are made of horn or um, uh, stone that are clear, um, but nobody's found any evidence that that actually happened. Um, so, uh, and of course, obviously, most hives have deteriorated to time. Um, though, uh, and, and most hives were, um, so like those two images there are long tubes that you would put the, the bees would build the comb and you would take the comb out like you were taking out coins from a ro tube of a roll of coins, right? Um, 
and the ancient hive, that horizontal hive was standard for Mediterranean. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yep, too far. There you go. <laughs> um, I'd just like to say really quick, I am so sorry. For yeah, some yeah. reason, my computer is not <laughs> agreeing with PowerPoint today. It's fine. Um, uh, I can sort of keep track of where you are, so it's good. Um, so the honey was harvested. So the, with those horizontal hives, they would go through and they would um, carve out the comb as they needed. And so uh, I would assume that one of the challenges that they would come to is that they don't know how far in they need to go without destroying the integrity of the colony. So that makes things kind of interesting. Um, so uh, the, that illustration there on the top is um, an apiary from Tel Revo, Tel Revo Israel. And um, it's got some 37 cylindrical hives. They were made of unbaked clay and straw. And um, they're going to, um, uh, clay and straw, the, the, and they found them, and they think that that area would have produced up to 18 liters or 14 kilograms of honey per year. Um, the Greek beehive, which is that basket looking thing, um, so he discovered it in 1675, which is outside of the scope of the SCA, but it was so unique that he had to write about it. And, um, but because it was so prevalent in the area in which he found it, um, I hypothesize that it has been there for a while, um, especially based off of how um, the ancient Greek and Roman um, talked about bees and how they operated within the hive. And if you can't, if, if you want to view the hive and make assumptions about what's going on inside of a hive without destroying the population of the hive, the Greek beehive would be the way to do it. Um, and the Greek beehive is what we would modernly call a top bar hive. Um, so uh, initially that was what all of my beehives were, was top bar hives, um, because it allows you to pull it out, um, all of that. Uh, the Greek beehive was discovered by Sir George Wheeler, who visited Greece in 17, uh, 1675, and he wrote about it in his book, A Journey into Greece in 1682. Um, uh, next slide. So, um, Middle Ages and the modern period. There we go. Um, really quick, somebody asked who wrote or discovered the Greek beehive? Right. Oh, and, I, and I saw that. I mentioned it. it. Yep, I did. I got it. Um, so that was, uh, and I'll say it again. Um, uh, I lost my note. Here it is. Sir, Sir George Wheeler. Um, in A Journey into Greece. <clears throat> okay, so Middle Ages and Modern Period. We have skeps, um, which are that traditional basket, honey, beehive thing that everybody recognizes as being bees. Um, one of the earliest evidence of skeps was found in a bog in Lower Saxony, Germany, and it's dated to the first century AD. Um, and they were used exclusively throughout Europe from the Middle Ages until about the 19th century and have their own methods for colony maintenance and honey extraction. Um, and they usually resulted in the destruction of the colony. Um, uh, one of the things that I have read is that um, it was common practice to take your skep that was, because you would want to, to weigh your skeps, you would pick them up and weigh them and say, oh, this is a good skep, it's got lots of honey in it, or this is a bad skep, it doesn't have, it's not as heavy. And so they would say, okay, this one, this one's gonna get harvested this year, and they would take the whole honking thing, and they would either smoke the suckers so that all of the bees went out of the hive, or they would just take the whole thing and toss it into the local lake. Because capped Home, honeycomb is capped and so it would preserve it would survive a dunk in the lake and then you just pull the comb out with all of the dead bees and you don't have to worry about it and you know so you still wanted your queens to swarm and and do all of that which in modern beekeeping we don't want them to swarm um uh, that's one of those things that we actively try and and avoid um 
So uh, because the skeps were made of baskets, and remember bees can only fly in 50 degree weather when it's not raining, common practice in, in Great Britain, at least, was to build little bee bowls, and you can find like some 250 examples across Britain, uh, where bees um, would, where beekeepers would put their skeps because it was very common for manors um, and property to have lots of, well, lots being like five or six up to 15 um, hives on a property that they would go through and manage. Um, one of the other interesting varieties of beehives was a tr bee tree. So bee trees, um, they did forest beekeeping in Northern and Eastern Europe. Um, as far back as 4,000 years ago. And um, they, you know, it's the, the finno ergarian populations that went for as far east as the Earls, as far west as the Baltics, absorbed by the Slavs, the Germans, the Lithuanians, the Bashkirs, the, you know, there were lots of people who did it. And um, one of the, um, one of the, the beekeeping um, or the UNESCO forest in Poland um, actually has some like 150 beehives in it, um, though none of them are currently occupied with bees. So uh, that was kind of one of those neat things that you can go through and do. Um, the larger, so they would go into a tree and they would cut an opening in the front and then they would carve out the insides somewhere between 40 and 60 liters. They would make a small hole on the side for the bees to go in and out of and then they would cover up the bigger hole and it would usually be four or five meters up inside of a tree. So it was it was a ways up there. Um, and uh, you know the and they would have bee forests and it was very cool. Um, and usually they would be filled based off the of the pollen population, right? So you can't have 500 beehives inside of a forest because there's not enough food. Though, depending upon the rules of the area, sometimes you had to build a new beehive every so often. Um, so they often had rules about who could go in and out of the forests. Um, uh, beekeepers that did forest beekeeping were often a type of forester right? So um, they were the people that were able to harvest things from the forest with the king's permission um, in a way that the regular common folk couldn't. Um, and then um, in modern periods, we have the Langstroth hive, which it wasn't technically the first movable frame hive because we also had the Greek beehive. And there was another guy who's considered like the father of beekeeping because he created a movable frame hive in like the 1700s. But Langstroth is famous because he discovered the bee space in 51. And um, this is the standard that modern beekeepers use today. So the technology for the Langstroth hive hasn't changed a whole lot. And basically all additional beekeeping technologies are based off of the availability and prevalence of the Langstroth hive. Next slide. Um, so some of the tools that we have for beekeeping, um, we have smokers. So beekeepers have used smokers and a variety of tools to facilitate the smokes into the hives since ancient times. Um, smoke is used to calm the bees, like everybody says they calm the bees. Now, whether or not we're actually calming the bees, is one of those great debates of science. You know, are they calming the bees? Are they sending them into fight or flight mode? Are they, whatever it is, it just makes the bees less likely to steam the, sting the beekeeper. Um, Cause I've heard a couple of different versions of, well, yes, you can do this or you can do that. So smoke is a pretty good thing. My, my um, filmographer just went outside to go start my smoker. Um, so that, that way we can do a hive inspection. Um, in uh, ancient Greece, it was recommended that we wanted to burn ox dung was best because for this smoke is particularly well suited to bees as if some affinity existed between them. Um, it was often thought in ancient times that bees originated from the carcasses of dead oxen. So, um, you know, burning ox smoke was a, a good bet. Um, so off the, the first smokers were obviously like torches, you know, you want to put your torch next to there, but sometimes that meant too much smoke or not enough smoke 
or, and it got complicated for how to figure out how to do that. So they eventually developed other smokers. Um, so that top image there is a smoker um, from ancient Rome. And it has um, like all the holes in the front and there's a large hole in the back and that's where you would feed the additional fuel so that that way it would create smoke and you had the handle so that, that way you could put it around. Um, I guess common practice was also to blow into it so that, that way you could have um, smoking things that way. Um, whether or not, uh, you know, beekeeping I feel is a more than a one person process for um, ancient beekeepers. Uh, so, um, uh, um, the um doo -doo 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 -doo. so they also use like incense burners um and uh these are called smoker pots um one of my goals is to have some of my pottery frame friends make um smoker pots for me um to use um i also have and and <laughs> sorry i'm pointing out to my my uh, assistant for where my lighter is which is on top of the shelf there um <clears throat> or it got knocked over. <laughs> um, so skin protection was um, uh, one of those things that as beekeepers we're most worried about because the bees like to sting. Um, so in ancient times there and medieval times, there was an ointment, um, wild mallow mixed with olive oil uh, was suggested to rub on your face and hands and arms in order to uh, minimize your attack from bees. Uh, there are lots of images in medieval texts that have like, um, uh, not necessarily a veil, but like a headscarf or a headband or um, which could in theory be used to pull over your face and protect you from bees. Um, I'm not gonna do it with this because I have a hood. Um, one of the later, uh, in later times they did create like the, the Lyra pipe hoods that had either, um, wire or basket woven faces. Um, and I've seen a lot of experimental archaeology with the basket woven faces, which are um, very cool. And that is one of my future goals for beekeeping. Um, uh, though there are suggestions for like the day before you go out and beekeeping, you have abstained from sexual relations and you don't approach them when drunk and only after you're washing yourself and you need to abstain from edibles which have strong flavor such as pickled fish and the liquids which accompany them and the stench of garlic and onions and other similar things. And that was from uh, Kalemwa from De Rustica. Um, so in the, the tree, and I don't have any images in this particular presentation, for tree beekeeping, um, they would use something called a lezwu in Poland, which is essentially a 15 meter rope that they would use to strap around the tree. They would toss it around the tree and then doing like move on um, tension things would pull themselves up the tree, which was really exciting. And then they would have like a bench. Um, oh, bananas. I didn't know that. And then they would go, um, and then they would sit, you know, four or five meters above the ground and do their hive manipulation, beekeeping, all of that other fun stuff. And they're sitting on basically a stick that is supported from just the tension of themselves, which is kind of really cool. Um, and then Germany, the Ziedlery had their a slightly different process. Sometimes they did have wedges um, put into the tree so that, that way you could climb up the tree. Um, oftentimes, later times they did have um, ladders um, and um, they had some really interesting tools. Um, they used uh, uh, carving axes, ad adizes, um, scorps, and chisels to make their spaces, um, which was pretty cool. Um, skeps are basically basket making, so you wanted to make sure that your um, that your brushes were of an even width. So there was oftentimes a horn or some kind of round tool that you would feed your brushes through, and then you would um, stitch them together. So you'd need a bodkin or a um, 
a spike to go through and, and put the binding through. And then um, modernly, there's lots of stuff. Uh, you know, you can go through and, you know, there's the hat, the suit, the hive tool, the knife, the gloves, the smoker, the brush. And then there's the things inside of the hive, like excluders and feeders and mouse guards and pollen collectors. And then there's things like, you know, what do you do with the stuff after? So there's the honey extruder and there's the honey press and there's the um, you know, wax melters and the solar melters and the, there's all kinds of stuff that you use for modern beekeeping, which is very, um, uh, can get very expensive very quickly. Last slide. Um, so for harvesting, things that come out of the hive is obviously honey. Um, and it's, you know, you know, uses a sweetener of food, though it's very, can be used medicinally. Um, the Egyptians had honey in over 900 different medical remedies. Um, it's used as sacrifices as a measure of wealth. Um, uh, there were rules about how far away you could have hives from other hives. Um, the, you know, you make mead with it, um, which can be documented as far back as the Rig Veda, which was um, 70,000 BC. Um, honey was used, uh, some interesting things about honey is that like Alexander the Great was um, transported from where he died in India to Greece in a sarcophagi full of honey, um, which I thought was very cool. And then um, it was one of the evidences of early biological warfare because in um, the Mediterranean Fertile Crescent area, um, there is a flower there that when you get honey that is produced by that flower, it, they use it to treat either um, epilepsy or if you overindulge in it, it could cause hallucinations. And so we would have people that would leave this mad honey along the road as your um, approaching army was coming through. And, uh, um, you know, they would consume this honey and then you would be able to go through and attack them at night because they're all hallucinating, which is kind of interesting. Um, wax was another um, thing that you can harvest from uh, the hive because it's uh, the bees secreted from their bodies. And it was used primarily for beeswax candles, jewelry and sculpture casting, hardening leather, cosmetics. Um, the Coptic Egyptians actually used it for their mummy portrait paintings, which is a whole separate kettle of rabbit hole that you can go down. Um, beeswax candles were, con superior, were considered superior to tallow candles um, because they were smokeless and provided a steady burning flame. So when the Reformation came through and the world became not Catholic, um, there was less need for uh, beeswax candles because they didn't do quite as ornate a ceremony. Um, yes, it is rhododendron honey, um, but not Pacific Northwest rhododendrons, it would be Turkish rhododendrons. Um, which is a totally different kettle of plant. <clears throat> um, wax, we also use them to strengthen threads as polishes, as finishes. Um, propolis is something that we can harvest from the hive today and they would have harvested in antiquity um, because the uh, Egyptians used it in their embalming practices. Um, it is a sticky resinous material that the bees use to help insulate their hives and it's a mix of bee saliva, beeswax, and then um, sap or pollen from trees. Uh, so here in the Pacific Northwest, it um, is very fur-based. It's very sticky. Um, in modern times, we harvest pollen and royal jelly. So when you buy your pollen that's bee pollen from your various supplement sources, you're going to end up with all the little itty bitty granules that are different colors. Um, that's collected using a very specific attachment that you put on your hive and you know you're basically taking it off of the bee as they enter the hive and so it's not something that that you would have been able to do in medieval times and it would have just been as easy to um you know shake the flower to get the pollen out of it as it would have been to try and collect it from bees and then um, royal jelly is a modern supplement that um, it can, you can purchase and apparently is, some people think is good for you. Um, it takes too much energy for me to try and play with it because you have to do specific queen rearing in order to harvest it because you harvest it from queen cells, which you only get after so many days and it requires lots of fun and excitement like that. Um, 
And that is the end of my presentation. So um, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to go out to my hive and um, we're going to go through and uh, um, uh, we're going to go to my other device, which is out by my hives, so that that way we can do some beekeeping. And um, there's my filmographer there. Um, <laughs> and she's uh, getting that ready for you. So um, give me just a minute and I will go out so that, that way I can hear Andrea ask her questions. So please formulate some questions and I will be right back. Okay, so we're going to da, 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 da. that one there. Okay, so filmographer gets to film while I put on all of my things. My very official modern hood with my modern gloves and modern tools because I'm scaredy cat and I want modern things. Do we have a working smoker? Is it working? I think it was. Mom, I don't need to put anything more in it. I just need it to keep it going. Yeah, <laughs> it is, it is flaming. Smooth. Yeah, they're smoothy. Mm -hmm. So what are those that you're putting on? That looks like the slap bracelets we uh, used to play with in the 90s. Basically, they're basically slap bracelets. They're specifically for bicycle riding so that you have um, bicycle, so that you're protected. You know, it, it uh, closes your pant leg while you bicycle. Um, and I'm using it to make it so that the bees don't go up my sleeves. Because that sounds yeah, so like it's not fun. Okay. I want you to hand it to me. Okay, one of my assistants gets to hold the bee hive open. Excellent. It's so nice to have family that's nearby that I can have a, a, a couple of assistants that are helping me beekeep. So I have a long Langstroth hive. So normally a Langstroth hive is only about 10 frames and you stack them on top of each other. Um, I have done uh, top bar hives in the past, and so this is my old top bar hive. It does not have any bees in it. Um, so this year I'm doing um, a long Langstroth hive, mostly because all beekeeping equipment is designed to accommodate the Langstroth, which is upsetting. So um, I'm going through and I'm going to trim down the comb that they've established up here on the top. And this is how I ended up stung last week, or um, two days ago. So somebody asked, uh, if somebody wanted to start a long Landstrom Hive, what kind of investment would they be looking at to get started? So, um, traditional Langstroth hives, uh, like the True Value hardware store, you can go in and spend about $250 and that's your initial investment for the hives. And then you would need to contact your local beekeepers association and figure out how to get a hold of bees. So for me, my local beekeepers association didn't do them this year, so I, um, I bought them from someone else and it's about $150 to $200 depending upon what kind of bees you're getting. Cause you can get them in a box where it's just bees or this year, if you can see, I have darker frames. Um, I bought a nucleus of, of, of um, bees. So they came pre queened and with comb inside of them. Um, what centuries were the skep hives used and how do you make a skep? 
So the skep hives were used predominantly from about the first century BC through the 19th century. So um, after, you know, Langstroth created his hive in 1851, um, and they actually, like, there are parts of Europe that you can still find your um, skep hives. In the United States, skep hives are illegal unless you are doing them for educational purposes. And that is because you can't go into a skep hive and check on the health of your bees. And so with the modern um, pests and diseases and things like that, um, you have to be able to go in and um, uh, check on the health of your hive and make sure that you're not creating um, poison, mites, and all of that other fun stuff. Um, and for those of you that are interested, I am wearing a linen under tunic and a wool over tunic with the anticipation that if they decide to sting me, I won't feel it. Uh -huh. How would you make a skep? If I were to make a skep, um, so uh, um, I, I really kind of do want to make a skep. And if I were to make a skep, I would go down here to the local um, uh, uh, drainage ditch, because here in the Pacific Northwest, we have lots of drainage, um, uh, what is that what they call them? Yeah, no. Oh. Yeah, right, yeah, I want, I want to go to retaining pool. ponds. Retaining mm -hmm. ponds, that's right it is, right? So when it rains and the runoff from your parking lots has to go somewhere, here in Washington, we have retaining ponds. Well, our retaining ponds that are right next to the house have lots and lots and lots of cattails and so I would really like to go through and take cattails and are you holding this? No. Okay. Don't let it go further back. You gotta hold it up right because the, the, the hinge won't pull it. Because um, cattails are plentiful, um, it's free, and um, apparently one of those other things that we can use to tie the, the comb together would be um, uh, blackberry vines which as you can see, I have in plenty. They are growing everywhere out here because that's what happens here in the Pacific Northwest. All right, so the whole family's come out to watch me inspect the hives. So um, this bar, the bees are, I use frameless hives or foundationless hives, excuse me. So I don't put anything in them and I let the bees go through and make what they're gonna make. So as you can tell, the bees are starting to put comb inside of this frame. Um, when I first started beekeeping, because I, I was using the top bars, I did go through and invest in some foundation. So this has foundation inside of it. It's wax foundation versus plastic foundation. And the bees have expanded it out. So you can see where the commercial foundation is based. And then this piece, which is not as smooth, is the commercial, or is the, the bee foundation that the bees have gone through. We're gonna see how I do. I don't normally go very far into my hives. I'm a, I'm a very lazy beekeeper, um, but it is, you know, it's something one of those things that you do. Okay. All right. So, setting this down here. This used to be a queen cell. So there was a queen there, and she hatched or was killed or whatever it is. Um, I don't have a lot on that side. It's just a bunch of bees. But on this side, okay, this is all honey. And this is some honey that's not capped. And um, I don't think I have any babies over here. But, you know, it's nice to know that I've got some honey that's going through. What do you put in your bee feeder? I do just a combination of sugar and water. Um, and I don't do it very often. Um, like, I should probably go through and fill this soon-ish, because we're running into a dearth of flowers out here. So, all right, we're going to this thing here. People mowed their dandelions. Yeah, people mow their dandelions. I don't have a... Yes. Already dandelion supply anymore. Ooh. 
Hello, girls. Yes, I know. I know. Here we go. All right. So, from, okay, so down here you can see these are babies, right? And this one and this one, those are boys. Those are drones. There's a drone cells for the, the boys. This is one of those ways that you can tell on the health of the hive is that if you have a good queen, she's laying lots and it should be pretty solid. And she doesn't have a lot of drones that she's creating. Um, my early queen, she had a lot of drones that she was creating. And so at one point in time, my hive was very drone heavy. Um, and you don't really want a lot of drones because what do they do but eat everything inside the hive. Oh, here, and there's my queen right there. I have an unmarked queen because um, she basically just came out of the hive. So that's pretty cool. I wasn't expecting to see her. I thought she'd be deeper. I know, I thought she'd be deeper too. That's a, that's a pleasant experience. So, and she's wandering around. It looks like she is laying babies. So that's exciting. I'll let her keep to it. Very exciting. Good job, guys. I'm going to set her over here, though, because I want to be able to go into the rest of the hive. And now that I know where she is, we just got honey all over everything. I did. I got honey all over my finger. You guys, catch that honey. Yeah, this is, this is the, the, I haven't been this far deep in a while, so it's kind of smushed it together. Are we all so fascinated by all of this? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Got bees, here she comes. Here I come, making a mess. Okay, so this is one of the darker frames, which means that I have had bees in this basically since the beginning. Nice. Um, April, when did you get them? I got them in April around, uh, around Easter. So there's lots of babies on both sides. And you can tell that the comb is much darker. And that's because they've had um, babies inside of it, right? So babies are not necessarily the cleanest of things. So I definitely don't want to eat the, the comb that is in this particular section. Now, I don't mind eating the honey, but I'd, I'd have to go through and harvest the honey separate. Like, you can't eat it as, like, honey comb. Um, and I'm going to go through and trim the top of this. What about the bottom? Yeah, the bottom's harder to manage. Um. Oh, kitties come to say hello. All right, and then this one is a new comb that I put in the middle because I needed, I wanted them to expand. I was really worried that they hadn't expanded because um, I've had these since April sure. yeah. and uh, um, they really have not gotten any bigger and I kind of expect them to. Um, so I'm not anticipating to harvest any honey from this particular hive today. Um, this is my only hive this year, um, but it might be something that I'll do next year. Do you have a centrifuge to harvest honey or do, or do you use a knife? I do not have a centrifuge, um, but because I have a Langstroth hive this year and I am a member of the local beekeepers association, I could use the beekeepers association centrifuge if I wanted to. So I could check it out from them and, and use the centrifuge. So how do you manage not squishing them while you work? Very good. I'm just a gentle beekeeper. I don't know. Um, so here's an interesting thing. Down over here in this corner, that's all drone comb, right? So that's a bunch of babies that are boys. And I don't know if they're, that's all boys because this queen has given up the ghost or if she thought that she needed more boys or I don't know. The old, I old might, well, she might be the old queen, probably not. Do you requeen every year? Um, I haven't. Um, usually I let the queen, I let them do whatever they want to do. Um, so in modern beekeeping, we want to prevent the bees from swarming. Like that's something that we actively try and prevent happening. Um, I do beekeeping mostly for the propagation of the species. Um, I am not diligent enough to be able to come out here and get, you know, honey every, you know, how often, however often you're supposed to get honey or um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a diligent beekeeper. Uh, 
I, I usually do about one har so when I do my top bars, I usually do about one harvest a year and I get about two pints of honey. Um, I'm in a Langstroth this year, so potentially, if I was really diligent about it and I was a very good beekeeper and I had a strong queen and, and they were very productive and I had good plants around me, I could get up to 14 pounds of honey. When historically did the technique shift from encouraging swarming to discouraging it? Um, with the Langstroth hive, because um, now you can do more commercial beekeeping, right? So you can move your hives a whole lot easier because they're all in boxes, everything's standardized shape. Um, this is one of my uh, personal crusades is that, um, you know, when you buy almonds from California, you are buying them to the detriment of honeybees in the United States uh, because commercial beekeeping says, oh, you know, takes bees that were wintering over in Michigan or Florida or the Carolinas and it ships them cross country to California where we have to wake them up in February so we force feed them and then they're there before the first flower blooms until the last flower blooms in these almond orchards and almond orchards you don't hear about almond honey because all bees get from almonds is pollen because they pollinate them so that means that um, honeybees need at least they need they need pollen and they need honey in order for them to have their complete carbohydrate if they don't have their complete carbohydrate then they are not as healthy or nutritious I think there's something here break off the bottom? Yeah, sure you want to break off the bottom thanks mm. Is that good? <laughs> Stop playing with it. All right, I'm going to go from the other end. There's nothing down here. That's probably why I'm going down here. So. And it's not as sticky. It means I can just lift them up. So, um, the if you notice the orange bits on the sides and up here, this is all propolis. So it creates a hermetic seal inside of the hive, so the bees can control what it is that they're doing inside of the hive. So they maintain the internal temperature of the hive. Um, like I said, they can do it up to 50 degrees. Um, so our average temperature today is supposed to not reach more than 68 degrees Fahrenheit here in the, here in the Pacific Northwest today. So it's a good day. And you see our bees are fanning their little bums over here. They're saying either the queen is here or it's too hot because um, they're letting the other bees know that this is where the queen is. So when you have like a swarm of bees, so you have a swarm that's in a tree and you get a beekeeper that goes through and catches them, we should have lots of bees out front of the new box where you caught them with bees doing this fanning, fanning behavior. Ooh, cross comb, that's exciting. Okay, so this is the very edge of my hive. Um, there's an end entrance over here so that's kind of why it's a little empty there. They're putting some honey in here which is nice to see. Um, and they're just kind of chilling. Ooh -hoo. Okay. If you were to harvest honey how would you do that? Um, if I were to harvest honey what I would end up doing is I would take a knife and I would just cut out the frame that I have. Um, I don't have a queen excluder in my hive um, so one of those things that Langstroth allowed for was that um, because the queen is bigger than the rest of the honeybees, this means that you want to go through and exclude her from where honey is. So that, that way she doesn't make babies in where you have your honey. And so, okay, here we go. So here we have cross comb. 
because they built the comb in the opposite direction of where I want them to do it. They've done it perpendicular. So I'm going to take this whole piece off. So I'm going to set it over here. Okay, then I'm going to set this one over here because this next bar has also got lots of cross combing that I need to go through and take care of. So, did I answer that question? How would I harvest honey? I would just cut it off and I would probably put it in a cookie tray and then take it inside. Oh, very carefully, <laughs> very carefully sweeping my bees with my very sophisticated bee brush that I have made from the weeds that I have. It's very sophisticated. They're getting more fancy. And they are. I'm going to do this last one and get rid of this cross comb and then we're going to close her up. So even though I didn't touch up all of the, the ones, we're going to, yeah, you can hear them getting noisier, maybe. I can hear them getting noisier. <laughs> right? <laughs> My official assistants are feeling worried about them. Okay. Interestingly, I don't actually hear any bees. <laughs> we do. <laughs> they are very hummy. Oh, this is heavy. This is heavy. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Oh, look at all that honey. Yep. Oh, and I broke a bunch of it off. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Steve says those are very mellow bees. But yeah, right. Well, I don't go in here very often, so that might be part of it. Right. Like I said, I'm a lazy beekeeper. What brand bees? Um, these are Italian, so they are supposed to be fairly mellow. Um, when I first was doing beekeeping, I was trying to get carnelian because I wanted... I don't remember what the trait was that I was looking for, for with carnelians. Wasn't it that they would survive the winter? Overwinter. Oh, yeah, they would overwinter better. That was what I was worried about. Didn't work. Right, right? It didn't work. <laughs> I have a really hard time getting my bees to overwinter. Um, so wow. there's, look at that bunch of honey right there. So I'm going to take this off. And they're all cleaning each other up, which is good. Yes, I know. You're not mad. At, you're mad at me. Um, and I'll come back later and go through and, um, and this is not capped honey, so it's not really worth it for me to go through and collect. Um, so it tastes good, I'm sure, but it's not um, capped, which for us in preservation land, right, you want your, your the capped honey is that ideal consistency between sugar and water. So if it's uncapped, it's still too moist. Uh, so someone asked where you were located. Uh, I am in Olympia, Washington, United States. And then um, do they reclaim the wax that you're putting in the bottom of the hive? So they won't reclaim the wax, but they will reclaim the honey. They might use some of the wax to create additional like propolis and things like that. Oh, that piece right there. Thank you. Oh, they are getting very noisy. Probably killed one or two. I'm sure I did. Yes, half a dozen. Half a dozen, but they have not. I, they have not stung me. So that's one of the things is that I can tell that they're anxious, but that they haven't stung me or tried to sting me because they're not swarming me. Um, because once they sting somebody, that creates a pheromone that the rest of them say, "Oh, look, there's an enemy. We need to protect the hive." So. A couple days ago when I was out here and I got stung, like right as I came out, um, I immediately closed up the hive and said, oh, I'm not playing with you today because I've already been stung and I'm not wearing as much protective gear, so I'm not going to go through and play with it. Oh, they're very noisy now. I know, girls. I know, I know, I know. Okay. You're mad at me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> shush, shush. Some of you are pretty sticky. Can you define extruder? So an extruder, 
um, yes, this one here. Um, an extruder extrudes using centri centrifugal force. Uh, am I missing one? Yeah, it's this one. This between, one. Between the lines are both going, so there are two. Do you want to leave between where she is now, or you want to put No, I'll move her back. Um, so an extruder, use, or extruder uses centrifugal force to spin the honey from the wax so that you can put the wax back into the hive. Does that make sense? Wait a minute, we have extruder and excluder. Excluder. Right, yeah. So the ex excluder excludes the queen from the hive or pieces of the hive. So that, that way you don't end up with bee babies in where your honey is. And the queen comb was where? It was right here, wasn't it? It was on the other side of the dark one. No, this so one right one? here. No, it, off the other side of the dark one. No, because all of this matches that. Oh, okay. okay. You should have taken notes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do. So somebody said that those are normally used in stacked boxes to keep the queen away from your top box. Right, exactly. So, so if I had a box, box if my box would be like this, and I would put the excluder on top, and then I would have another box on top of it, and that would be the super that I would harvest honey from. All right, I'm gonna leave that alone. We're gonna take these suckers off. And I'm ready to close. Put on the lid? No. Just this? Yep. Da, da, da. Excellent. Thank you to my assistants. Um, okay, cool. Any other questions? Uh, uh. There we go. We'll give any them just questions? a minute to see if they have any other questions. <laughs> um, have you heard that bees prefer blue flowers over other colors? Is that true? I don't know about the color preferences of bees. I do know that they prefer a red UV light um, with, uh, versus, a, um, versus other UV colors. So flowers often have um, landing zones on them that are, um, uh, that are UV colored specifically for the various types of insects that pollinate them. So um, a, a flower that has more red UV than other UV colors will attract honeybees. Um, I saw that question come through about the metal roof. Yeah, does um, the metal my, roof help keep animals out? Um, my metal roof is so that that way the rain doesn't go in, because uh, here we're in the Pacific Northwest, it rains um, just a little bit. And, uh, um, but mine is specifically for, for rain, though my roof is kind of heavy, so that helps keep things like raccoons and possums out from it. Um, so there's that. Bye, Cal, Seppa, and the other one. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Someone has another question. <laughs> they have another question. They're typing. I can tell. You mentioned having issues with overwintering. Is it common to lose a hive? Um, for me, I have, in the six years that I've done beekeeping, I have only had hives overwinter twice. Um, and uh, when they do overwinter, I then lose them by Memorial Day. So for whatever reason, they don't like me after the winter. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, our temperatures get down to freezing, but not necessarily below freezing. And so um, it, it's about the bees being able to maintain their internal temperatures and um, surviving. Um, sometimes I've actually lost hives, like they just decide that they're not interested in overwintering with me, and so they leave in October. And then I do the, but, but you left. <laughs> like, I can't even try and protect you because you left. Um, 
Yeah. So, um, I do my last honey harvest. If I do a honey harvest around Labor Day, um, what was that? Alaska, they buy bees every year. Right. In Alaska, you have to buy bees every year because they just don't survive. Um, yeah. Uh, so if someday I may purchase a queen from, um, beekeepers up on the Olympic Peninsula, which are breeding hardier bees. Um, this is also one reason why I don't try and, um, uh, uh, ma manage my queens because I figure if they're going up into the drone congregation area, the DCA, which is a mile above us, um, and they find drones that have overwintered or um, are a slightly different variety or all of that other fun stuff, then, then I'm, I'm more likely to have bees that will be able to overwinter. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you had to give the biggest piece of advice for a starter, what would it be? Read as much as you possibly can and join your local beekeepers association. Um, I'm in New Zealand. Apparently we have native bees that burrow in the ground. Do you have ones like that in the USA? So we have bees that do burrow. Um, for us, they call them ground wasps and they sting and we don't like them. Um, uh, there are other bees that do, I'm sure there are other bees or, or um, bugs that that live in the ground, but not honeybees that we appreciate. Um, cause, cause our ground wasps up here are also known as yellow jackets, which are, um, uh, colloquially assholes with wings. Um, because they, they also like, they eat proteins. So they're more likely to, um, come to your picnic and, uh, bug you well, yeah, and eat your hamburger or bug you while you've been sweating because they're attracted to the, the salt as well as the protein. Um, and so they can make events very cumbersome and challenging. Um, can you, uh, can you talk about why they wouldn't want bees to swarm? So, um, it, swarming bees in modern times means that you've lost a hive, right? It means that, that you're not controlling it and the bees aren't staying with you and you're not able to collect the, the products that they're providing because you can't guarantee that a swarming hive will stay in your apiary. Like it might go two or three or four miles away to some tree and you might not be the beekeeper that gets called for, to recover those bees. And so then you've lost all of the production that they produce. Um, and uh, swarming hives are less likely to be productive that year. So you will have hives that are, thank you. Um, uh, you will have hives that because they swarmed didn't produce as much honey. Whereas if they hadn't have swarmed, you would have gotten your full 14 gallons of honey and um, were able to, to collect that. Do you have any other questions? I'm not seeing any other questions. Somebody did say they, their hive died from mites. Yes, the, the varroa mite is very virulent. Um, I uh, tend, sometimes do powdered sugar coatings on my hives because I try and be as pesticide free as I can. Um, I cannot call my hive 100% organic because I can't guarantee where my bees are getting um, uh, their pollen and nectar from. So I can't say that I have organic hives, but I don't use any man-made pesticides. I try and be 100% um, as natural as I can. Um, also, lazy beekeeper. So um, that's one of those things that I go through and do. Oh, the powdered sugar, just like the honey, it makes them clean them faster than the, their neighbors. And that will take the varroa mite off of the back of the bee and uh, cause it to to go down into the bottom of the hive and not go back on the bees. Yes. I also use cinnamon in my hives to keep the ants down because ants don't like cinnamon. So if you have an ant infestation in your house, put down cinnamon and then your house will smell nice and the ants won't come in. That's really good to know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Excellent. Um, you can always, uh, um, I am also in the process of presenting uh, at Athenaeum for on tier. So if, uh, if you want to find that, uh, I don't know how long that presentation is going to be up, but a lot of the information I went over is going to be on that. And then um, you can always leave comments and feel free to contact me 
um, offline. Um, my email address is a modern medievalist at gmail.com. So uh, if you have any other questions, feel free or reach out. We'll get you squared away.